My name is Grace Pfeiffer. I'm a junior majoring in philosophy and religion. Our speaker tonight, Matthew B. Crawford, is a senior fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture at the University of Virginia and a motorcycle mechanic and custom parts fabricator. <laughs> he earned his BS in physics at the University of California at Santa Barbara and a PhD in political philosophy from the University of Chicago. A contributing editor at The New Atlantis, Dr. Crawford has written for numerous publications, including The New York Times Magazine, The American Interest, and The Hedgehog Review. He is the author of Shop Class as Soulcraft, an inquiry into the value of work, which was named Editor's Choice by the Financial Times of London. And most recently, The World Beyond Your Head, on becoming an individual in an age of distraction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Crawford. Well, if you've made it um, here to the bitter end of our conference, I think it means you probably have a taste for dystopia. I'm really very happy to be here uh, at Hillsdale, and it's not just because I really like eagles. Um, <laughs> I, I was over in the library and I took a photo in which I managed to get five eagles in one frame. That's, that's a lot of eagles. Um, no, it's really because uh, Hillsdale is a place that has put a concern for self-government at the very center of its mission. And I think that's precisely the concern that can help us get a handle on what I take to be um, the troubling logic of artificial intelligence. <clears throat> now, one way you could sort of find your way into this political dimension of AI would be to talk about, say, smart cities. That's a term that we're hearing a lot. Uh, what's meant by that is that the whole physical plant and infrastructure of a city, your behavior in it, your movements through it will be orchestrated by an urban operating system that is financed, built, and controlled by a cartel of tech companies rather than democratic institutions. I think the proper way to think about that is as a transfer of sovereignty. But that's not what I'm going to talk about, <laughs> quite. I want to talk about the effect that AI is likely to have on the habits and dispositions of self-government that underlie our political order. And I want to get at this by drilling down into one very particular area that's been marked for automation, and that's driving. Now, I'm someone who enjoys driving. I'm guessing some of you probably do as well, which might prompt you to think about what we're being asked to give up. Now, maybe it's not much. Maybe it's something pretty trivial. But at the risk of stating my conclusion before I've argued for it, I think this one narrow domain is instructive for thinking about what's at stake more broadly. And that is the move to make skilled and intelligent human action obsolete in the name of a rationalist utopia, one that takes a dim view of human beings and their native capacities. So these remarks are drawn from a book I'm currently writing titled Why We Drive Toward a Philosophy of the Open Road. And when I say open road, and when I say open, I mean to invoke the space for human agency that's left open when people are left to their own devices. So in this brief talk, I'm going to focus on different ways of coordinating traffic as instantiating different forms of human rationality, which in turn express and support different types of political culture. Close your eyes, if it helps, and imagine a typical suburban thoroughfare. Traffic is light. You're at an intersection. 
Most of the cars are stopped, waiting. What are they waiting for? Well, of course, they're waiting for the light to change. We do a lot of this. If you're in a hurry or prone to impatience, as I am, to sit there for minutes when you can see perfectly well the approach of cars from every direction requires a certain amount of emotional labor. The emptiness of the intersection invites movement, but the law prohibits it. There's a conflict between what reason prescribes in the particular circumstances and the law, which is indifferent to these circumstances. You feel this as an arbitrary restriction on the movement of your body, like a trapped animal. So here's a radical thought experiment. What if we used our blessed eyeballs to determine if it's okay to turn left through an intersection? And our brains, okay? I wanna show you something. This is an intersection in Addis Ababa, <laughs> Ethiopia. Autonomous intersection management, traffic see, control for the future. A two project very from busy the streets. Of Texas. Watch the pedestrians. Okay? You get the basic idea. So there's no markings of any kind on the pavement, no curbs, no control lights. And what you see is a spectacle of improvisation and flow that's beautiful to behold. They merely slow down, pay attention, and find their way through. The efficiency of it is stunning. Now pause to think about that. Isn't efficiency the very claim made on behalf of our overgrown thicket of traffic control, the putative benefit that justifies it? With the Addis Ababa intersection as a point of comparison, we may be emboldened to ask, does every possible path within a parking lot and of ingress and egress from a parking lot need to be determined by curbs and islands every intersection of a cross street with a thoroughfare, controlled by the batch turn-taking enforced by an eight-way traffic light. I've traveled the world a fair bit, and I don't think I've ever seen anything like the inefficiency of the overregulated uh, American suburb, which we call the land of the free and the home of the brave. Now, maybe related, in the last few years, red light cameras have sprouted up at many of the major intersections where I live in Virginia. These have been proliferating throughout the US. They would seem to express a tacit recognition that our compliance with this kind of traffic control must be secured through surveillance and the threat of fines because it is not reasonable. Now at present, automated traffic enforcement consists of two elements, red light cameras and photo radar for speeding. <clears throat> And I go into this in some depth in the book, but I'm just gonna give you a few highlights. In fiscal year 2016, the District of Columbia took in over $100 million from these cameras. And that's fairly typical. The rationale offered by the police is of course safety. And they take great offense at the suggestion that money might be driving it. Yet it seems to be intersections where the red light cameras were installed were selected not because they were especially prone to accidents, but rather because they had the greatest volume of flow and the shortest yellow lights. And wherever this has been looked into by investigative journalists, this has been the case. The duration of a yellow light is something traffic engineers consider very carefully. Uh, as the frequency of accidents at an intersection is very sensitive to this variable, which they call amber time. Now in the literature, they refer to the dilemma zone. The light turns yellow, and you have to decide if you're gonna proceed through <clears throat> or break. And the more compressed that window is, the more unpredictable the behavior of the driver in front of you. The Chicago Tribune hired researchers at Texas A&M to conduct a study of Chicago's red light camera system. 
they found that the city routinely placed cameras at intersections that had few, if any, injury-related crash problems, leaving the cameras little room to improve safety. At the same time, they found the unnecessary cameras at more than 70 intersections prompted many drivers to slam on the brakes in efforts to avoid an automated ticket, causing a significant increase in injury-related rear-end crashes near cameras throughout the city. <laughs> and of course, Chicago being Chicago, <clears throat> it was also discovered that the city manager was getting a kickback of 10 grand for every camera installed. Now this research going back 10 years recently confirmed shows that increasing amber times by just half a second from three to three and a half seconds resulted in a decrease in accidents of up to 25% and a decrease in red light violations of up to 40%. And doing this is free. But evidently free safety isn't nearly as appealing to the authorities as free money. In many cities, it's been found that when the red light cameras go up, the amber times are reduced. Now, the company that dominates this market is Redflex Traffic Systems, based in Australia. <clears throat> they install the cameras at little or no cost to a city, monitor them, process the images, generate the citations, and coach the local authorities to say the right things about the importance of saving lives and they take about a third of the proceeds. Okay, so there's nothing new about municipal corruption, and it isn't especially interesting. Still, there's a generalization to be drawn from these cases. Sometimes rules are deliberately formulated to be at odds with reasonableness by parties who have an interest in the conflict this creates. The idea that decision-making can be removed from human beings is a bit of mystification. What machines do is follow the laws of physics. They do, however, offer a screen of neutrality and an appearance of necessity behind which the operation of human judgment becomes harder to make out and harder to hold to account. The case of Chicago is instructive as the nature of the algorithmic control, the end being served by it, was uncovered only because the Tribune had the resources to hire forensic engineers. So it turned out the city had adjusted the assumptions used in the standard equations to determine amber times. Whenever there's a program of subjecting human activities to rational control, we do well to ask if this really accomplishes an increase in the rationality of the system or an increase in control, or rather a transfer of control through a dislocation of the activity of reasoning away from individuals. With the transfer of control comes a transfer of wealth to whoever's in charge of the algorithm. And this is highly germane to the way we experience public authority increasingly. It seems to be exercised on behalf of a transglobal tribe that may as well be located in Australia as at City Hall. Authority has a sociological address more than a geographical one. And I think a growing awareness of this contributed to the populist earthquake of 2016. I said earlier that our compliance with the kind of traffic control predicated on an excess of rule following must be secured through surveillance and the threat of fines because it's not reasonable. How do we experience this compliance? It has an entirely different character from the kind of citizenly deference based on shared rationality that emerges naturally among people who need to cooperate. And this difference gets to the heart of what it means to be free. The Addis Ababa intersection displays an impressive set of human qualities, precisely those capacities for judgment and cooperation that are systematically undermined by the modernist enthusiasm for systems of rational control that can be projected from afar, superimposed on a landscape treated as a grid of predetermined moves. These superimpositions tend to receive reflexive deference because we have no alternative vocabulary 
or conceptual frame for thinking about our common life beyond that of administration. This inarticulacy leaves us unable to resist top-down projects hatched by various functionaries who nurse visions of order and have no qualms about imposing them on a populace they regard as unruly and incompetent. This has a cumulative effect on our character. If we're educated into rule following with sufficient rigor, perhaps we'll lose entirely that physiological response appropriate to a trapped animal. Maybe this is the socialization appropriate to a modern society. But how far do we want to go? Do we want to invoke the fact of human adaptability, clearly we can put up with quite a lot, as a legitimizing principle for the indefinite remaking of human life according to rationalist dreams? Ivan Illich wrote of the rising cost of fitting man to the service of his tools. Increasing manipulation of man becomes necessary to overcome the resistance of his vital equilibrium, he writes. It takes the form of educational, medical, and administrative therapies. Now, when you're sitting in traffic, such therapies have to be self-applied. We all have our techniques for getting our zen on, right? <laughs> our approach to traffic control can thus serve as a window into a more general trend, a creeping transformation in the character of public authority. Invariably, whatever entity, public or private, is empowered to pursue dreams of order understands itself as benevolent. And just as reliably, the effect of its work is to extend the purview of its own authority. Too often this comes at the expense of some customary practice or informal accommodation that has served us well enough without expert tutelage. But such folk practices have no lobby, and the concepts we need to defend them enjoy little currency. Worse, the very fact that they are long established is an offense to the idea of progress. The progress promised often turns out to be illusory, but the enforced obsolescence of our native skills quite real. Clearly, when viewed through the categories of today's established political options, the argument I'm making here would have to count as libertarian. But it doesn't proceed from a naive faith in the generative effects of disorder. Disorder is bad. What I mean to argue is that the project for rational control rests on a very thin conception of what con reason consists of and too narrow a view of where it is located in society. The Addis Ababa intersection is a picture of rational order. It's closer to the kind that emerges in organic systems than the kind that sprouts from a conceit of comprehensive mastery. Perverse consequences follow from trying to disburden us of exercising judgment. This is what we're doing when we entrust the orchestration of daily life to systems, whether of painted lines or of algorithms, that are blind to the extraordinary finesse of human beings in coping with situations of fluid uncertainty in concert with one another. Infrastructure predicated on too rigid an ideal of control fails to accommodate the exercise of our human capacities or to exploit the social efficiencies they offer, leading instead to the atrophy of the human. Let us be more bold, like the Ethiopians. I said a moment ago that if forced to fit in today's available political categories, my argument here would count as libertarian, but this needs a little elaboration because clearly I'm not seeking simply to expand the domain of choice as against regulation. Rather, I'm concerned with the exercise of human capacity such as prudence or judgment and sociality. And these find little accommodation in the market language of individual choice. 
But the argument is libertarian in a special sense that may be unique to the thought of Michael Oakeshott, the English philosopher. On the one hand, he takes liberty his central concern. But on the other hand, he's a great defender of tradition, of customary practices, not because they're better than any possible alternative, but merely because they're familiar. Somewhat like Edmund Burke, he sees the historical sediments and inertia of custom as the best defensive bulwark against the imposition of rationalist dreams. And it's these latter that pose the real threat to liberty. Now, if at some late date in the future, <clears throat> a highly coordinated system of autonomous cars were to achieve the level of efficiency that prevails today at an intersection in Addis Ababa, it would be counted a smashing success. But to achieve this miracle would require massive expenditures by you and me and the wholesale reworking of the urban landscape according to the dictates of a handful of private enterprises and their fellow dreamers in the public sector. So what would that look like? It looks very similar. Autonomous Intersection Management, Traffic Control for the Future, a project from the University of Texas at Austin. Most intersections today are controlled by traffic signals, stop signs, or roundabouts. However, even when people do follow these protocols, intersections are the source of much traffic congestion kind of like and eye accidents. contact. Even though they take up a small percentage of the roadways, Roughly one quarter of all accidents and one third of all fatal accidents occur at intersections. It is now apparent that autonomous cars are well on their way to becoming a reality. At first, they will need to follow the same intersection control protocols that were designed for people. But this project considers, once most cars on the road are autonomous, whether we can do better than that by way of an AI-based coordination mechanism. Oh, you get the idea. In this research, we introduced a so, new multi-agent I mean, that video wasn't, you know, it's not meant as parody, but <laughs> after watching the Addis Ababa intersection, you know, you kind of get the feeling that we're kind of solving a non-problem here. <laughs> Ivan Illich offers the idea of a radical monopoly, which is not merely the predominance of one firm to the exclusion of others, but a reordering of what's possible. He writes, the establishment of radical monopoly happens when people give up their native ability to do what they can for themselves and for each other in exchange for something better that can be done for them only by a major tool. He writes, monopoly is hard to get rid of when it has frozen not only the shape of the physical world, but also the range of behavior and of imagination. Radical monopoly is generally discovered only when it's too late. Now, closely related to the idea of radical monopoly, uh, a major tool in his usage is one that makes us dependent on claims of special expertise remote from our own experience. Thus, learning becomes the monopoly of a regime of compulsory schooling, for example. Intending to the ills of the body becomes nearly the exclusive preserve of what we call the healthcare system. We forget how to do things for ourselves and for one another. He writes, institutions now optimize the output of large tools for lifeless people. By contrast, a pluralism of limited tools that are directly intelligible support what Illich calls conviviality. These are individually accessible tools to support the meaningful and responsible deeds of fully awake people. Now, Lilich was born in 1926 and published these words in 1973. One of the examples he gives of radical monopoly is actually the automobile. He writes, cars can thus monopolize traffic. They can shape a city into their image, practically ruling out locomotion by foot or by bicycle in Los Angeles. Motor traffic curtails the right to walk. Now this observation of his is at the heart 
of what's sometimes called the new urbanism that seeks to restore walkability to cities. And I'm very sympathetic to this movement. And the argument I'm making here is closely analogous if I can concede the apparent irony of invoking the car haters' basic concerns, but now on behalf of driving. In some respects, the automobile is a major tool in Illich's sense compared to a bicycle. It ties us into dependence on the expertise of others. So even the mechanic now relies on diagnostic trouble codes that um, are the intellectual property of the manufacturer, or so the car makers are trying to claim at least right now. And into a necessary system of bureaucracy, so the DMV with all its hassles. <clears throat> but the automobile is nonetheless a tool that admits of flexibility, judgment, and individual initiative in its use. In fact, that's its defect, according to our utopians. An urban operating system of interlocked autonomous cars would merely shift the location of the governing algorithm from painted lines, curbs, and enforcement cameras to something machine executable. The spirit of it is the same. The appeal of automating our adherence to the algorithm, of, of course, is to take recalcitrant human beings out of the picture entirely. Michel de Certeau <clears throat> write that, wrote that, walkers are practitioners of the city, for the city is made to be walked. I think that could be said with equal justice of drivers, especially in a city such as LA that was made to be driven. On New Year's Eve of 2018, Pope Francis expressed the ethical significance of this in a homily at St. Peter's Basilica, in which he praised drivers who, quote, move in traffic with good sense and prudence. Prudence is a capacity for judgment that we exercise when rules are inadequate to guide our behavior. It comes only from experience and is cultivated only when we're free to err. He wrote, these and a thousand other behaviors express concretely love for the city. In a beautiful phrase, Francis suggested that prudent drivers are artisans of the common good, who love their city not with words, but with deeds. From my own travels, <clears throat> I think some of the best urban drivers I've seen have been in London. The give and take of the cabbies and commuters as they jostle to advance is a supple play of deference and assertion, professional courtesy and opportunities seized that prizes traffic flow over rule following. Traffic flow is a shared good of an interesting sort. It's a fragile, emergent property of a collective, a state that happens only if everyone is paying attention to the situation and brings a disposition of flexibility to it. At times, it resembles an improvisation among musicians. Urban driving at its best is an experience of civic friendship, an act of trust and solidarity that makes one proud to belong to the human race. Rules become more necessary as trust and solidarity decline in society, and reciprocally, the proliferation of rules and the disposition of rule following that they encourage further erode our readiness to extend to our fellow citizens a presumption of competence and goodwill. Driverless cars are programmed to follow traffic rules to the letter and err on the side of caution, making them an awkward fit to share the road with human drivers. The New York Times reported that one Google car couldn't get through a four-way stop because its sensors kept waiting for other human drivers to stop completely and let it go. The human drivers kept inching forward, looking for the advantage, <laughs> paralyzing Google's robot. <laughs> of course, what human drivers do is make eye contact in such a situation or read other cues of social interaction, allowing them to negotiate ambiguous cases of right of way and work things out on the fly. Some drivers are more assertive, others more defensive. It's not a stretch to say there's a kind of body language of driving. 
this kind of improvisation works just fine for the most part. But social intelligence is hard to reproduce with machine executable logic. Therefore, it's concluded, human beings must become more like machines in order to make the road more hospitable to robots. <laughs> According to the same Times article, Dmitry Dolgov, head of software for Google's self-driving car project, that would be Waymo, said that one thing he had learned from the project was that human drivers needed to be, quote, less idiotic. <laughs> Such an inference comes easily when you conceive reason as a computer scientist does, as asocial and fundamentally rule-like. From such a perspective, human beings do indeed look like inferior versions of computers. It's a theory of mind, the basic assumptions of which are shared by the discipline of economics and enjoys a certain cultural prestige. Behavioral economics shares these assumptions and departs only by emphasizing our failure to actually act rationally, that is, as faithful calculators of our own utility. The corollary, which seems inescapable along the intellectual axis that runs from Silicon Valley to the rulemaking apparatus of government, is that life can be improved by taking decision-making away from individuals, whether through administrative nudges that are basically algorithmic, or through automation. As we've learned from studies of the automated airplane cockpit in particular, one result of being thus relieved of the exercise of our intelligence is that our skills atrophy from lack of use, leading to demands for yet more automation. Regarding the mind as an inept computer becomes a self-fulfilling theory. Um, Iris Murdoch wrote, the man is the animal who creates images of himself and then comes to resemble the images. I think it's in this vicinity that we should look if we want to understand why self-driving cars play prominent roles in several dystopian films, including Blade Runner, Total Recall, Minority Report, and WALL-E. In these films, drivers have become passengers and appear as a new class of administrative subjects to be managed. Now, I use the word subject to mean both an object of rule and the type of person, the form of subjectivity, that is assumed or required by such rule and thereby brought into existence. A passenger is detached, isolated from others, whereas the give and take of urban driving is a realm of interaction that demands the skills of cooperation and improvisation. As such, driving is a form of organic civic life and the disappearance of civic feeling is, I think, key to the dystopian mood of these films. Driving is a way of being up with others while having shared concrete interests at stake. Tocqueville suggested that the habits of collective self-government are cultivated in practical activities that demand cooperation, and such habits are indispensable to democratic political culture. But from the perspective of a central power, whether governmental or technical commercial, what is wanted is an idealized subject of a different sort, an asocial one who permits an atomized account of human beings to be operationalized. There's an Iggy Pop song where he sings, I am a passenger, I stay under glass. A society of such isolated subjects will be more efficiently and pliably administratable. I want to read you a passage from uh, Michael Oakeshott, published in 1956. Now try listening to it imaginatively as des describing the response of some Google apparatchik upon viewing the Addis Ababa intersection video that I showed you, or a typical street in London. He writes, Surveying the scene, some people are provoked by the absence of order and coherence, which appears to them to be its dominant feature, its wastefulness, its frustration, its dissipation of human energy. Such people are apt to exaggerate the current disorder. The absence of a plan is so conspicuous that the small adjustments and even the 
more the massive arrangements which restrain the chaos seem to them nugatory. They have no feeling for the warmth of untidiness, but only for its inconvenience. But what's significant is not the limitations of their powers of observation, but the turn of their thoughts. They feel that there ought to be something that ought to be done to convert this so-called chaos into order, for this is no way for rational human beings to be spending their lives. Like Apollo, when he saw Daphne with her hair hung carelessly about her back, they sigh and say to themselves, what if it were properly arranged? Moreover, they tell us that they have seen in a dream the glorious, collisionless manner of living proper to all mankind. And this dream they understand as their warrant for seeking to remove the diversities and occasions of conflict which distinguish our current manner of living. It's a vision of human activity coordinated and set going in a single direction and of every resource being used to the full. And such people understand the office of government to be to turn a private dream into a public and compulsory manner of living. Almost finished here. One theme that's emerged with force in my inquiry into driving is that of self-government broadly understood, both as an individual capacity for self-command and as a political dispensation that we continue to take for granted, even as it erodes under our feet. Thus, self-government might mean the ability to skillfully control one's car, the ability to temper one's impatience with other drivers, and the ability to keep one's attention directed to the road, on one hand, and on the other hand, larger questions such as, who gets to decide what sort of regime of mobility we will inhabit? These different scales on which we pose the question of self-government are surely interlocked or imply one another. For example, if we're so distracted behind the wheel that we're already driving as if our cars were self-driving, this suggests we need some benevolent entity to step in and save us from ourselves by automating a task that we're no longer capable of doing for ourselves. In drawing a straight line from self-command to self-government in the political sense, I mean to claim the problem of driving for the liberal Republican tradition of political reflection. This tradition holds that a people worthy of democracy must be made up of individuals capable of governing their own behavior in the first place and have therefore earned their fellow citizens' trust. When you're leaned into a blind curve on a two-lane country road on a motorcycle, it becomes very clear that the road is a place of mutual trust. This is one of the most interesting things about it. Driving is thus ripe for the intention of political theorists who are interested in what a Republican social order looks like at the fine grain. Let's understand this fragile thing while it still persists in such unobtrusive pockets of daily life as driving. Such pockets might hold clues that can guide our hopes for the renewal of social trust more broadly. The possibility of trust and cooperation has an intrinsic reciprocal tie to the presumption of individual competence. Taken together, as they must be, these are the constituent elements of self-government as a social reality without which self-government as a political form becomes untenable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Crawford will be signing copies of his books, Shop Class as Soul Craft, as well as The World Beyond Your Head, um, immediately following the lecture. Uh, we now have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone to be brought to you. Just one down here. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm a little confused um, 
with the analogy of the roadway, um, so could, could you explain a little bit more how, I, I guess I just don't understand how an efficient roadway that runs smoothly um, with self-driving cars, for instance, isn't also an example of beauty and improvisation. Because, yeah, I guess, I guess for the programmers, like, there is an amount of trust there that you have to put in the people who programmed. I um, wonder if you could explain that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, you can think of it as a, just a transfer of the beautiful thing from the drivers to a small cater of programmers. And actually, one interesting thing about that video I showed of you know the automated intersection is precisely that it does look like the Addis Ababa intersection, amazingly. Um, so at one level, that would be a big improvement over what we currently have, which is sitting there at a stoplight for no reason. Um, so what, then why worry about it? Well, I think that the, the stuff I read from Ivan Illich gets at the reason, namely um, this kind of disburdening us of the exercise of judgment makes us dependent on this major tool, as to use his term, that is sort of remote from um, it makes us dependent on sort of special expertise. And uh, I was trying to suggest that that's worrying as a kind of um, development in political psychology. So, uh, you know, it could be that we could have much more efficient traffic flow in urban areas be if this whole vision were to come to fruition. And so one has to weigh that. Uh, I mean, that's a very, would be a very real benefit. Um, which, you know, that's what we're all talking about is that benefit. I'm trying to raise kind of a, um, a different set of concerns that I think we need to bring to the table on that. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I'm over here. Hi. No. <laughs> um, so I just had a question similar to Dietrich's about the intersections that you were talking about earlier. So the Addis Abada uh, intersection you're talking about, since 2017, there's been 1,500 deaths from that intersection. Um, and it has a population, the entire country, of about 3 million people. By contrast, LA, um, last year there was 244 deaths, and the population of LA is 4 million, so a million more. Okay. Um, so I guess my question is, it seems like this rational order that we have in America has, to a very large extent, helped save lives. Um, so why would we not advocate for something like AI that would probably, with self-driving cars, not only help save lives, but also increase efficiency? Touche. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, once the safety thing comes up, everything crumbles. <laughs> everything. Because that is the democratic morality is safety. Um, it's interesting. Um, so I, what I should have done is showed an intersection in Southeast Asia, which would have looked nearly identical. Traffic fatalities there are dramatically lower than the US. Now that's an interesting question, how that can be. Um, has something to do with the culture, I suppose. But no, that is a fair objection. Um, I don't know. The, I didn't know the stats for Ethiopia in particular, but I do know that in some of those African cities, it's, it's very high. So yeah, safety. <clears throat> um, that's obviously the most massive consideration that that gets invoked to um, stop any any sort of, of these further considerations. And it's you know it's a very real one. You don't want to be dismissive about it. Um, but it's also true that I think we're getting dumber and dumber. Um, let, me, let me bring in another sort of safety thing because I, I mean, it's a legitimate concern. I ride a motorcycle, that's, that's my usual commuting. I mean, I put it in a lot of miles. Tra uh, motorcycle deaths shot up dramatically. Um, Right, starting right after 2007, which is when the smartphone appeared. So people are so enthralled watching their cat videos on YouTube that they can't be bothered to watch the road. <clears throat> One way 
to view the autonomous car push is that it's Silicon Valley trying to solve a problem that it created, um, you know, which I appreciate. <laughs> but th we've sort of trained ourselves into being so careless that it's a very real question um, whether American drivers could handle anything like the Addis Ababa intersection. I don't think we could. I think we've kind of, um, we're that bad at this point. But I don't know, maybe, I mean, Germany, actually, yeah, it, Germany has a real driving culture where, you know, famously the Autobahn, there's no speed limit. And you know what people do? They stay on the right unless they're going like 130 miles an hour and it's like there's a sorting. People sort themselves out, and they're paying attention. They're looking in their mirror, and like everybody's on the same page. Um, a l less extreme version of that, California is the one state in the nation where it's legal to split lanes for a motorcycle, which is done e everywhere in the world, uh, but not in the US. But it is in California. And you know what? Motorists actually have been trained uh, to do that, interesting story, the folklore among motorcyclists is that it was the CHP, the Highway Patrol, that lobbied to make it legal in California because they patrol on bikes and they reasoned that m motors would be trained to look for cyclists if everyone was doing it. Um, and it, I think it was successful. So, I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Ellie, I'm a sophomore here, and um, just kind of on the topic of that driving metaphor, I actually spent a month in China riding taxis around some of the busiest cities in that country, and while what you said that trust and deference is definitely present, there are also half-hour traffic jams, <laughs> and yeah. just um, kind of on that metaphor, I was wondering if humans are as naturally coordinated and cooperative as we like to think they are, or is there a certain amount of Road regulation? Yeah. Well, well, there is that, actually. <laughs> um, but also, are we naturally inclined to live communally and defer to one another and trust one another, or is that something that has to be taught? I think there are big cultural differences in that, and clearly, I think the, the very low uh, death rate from traffic in Southeast Asia is probably a good index of how that's true. Um, I had a thought, but I've sort of dropped it. Um, so, remind me of your question just briefly again. I'm sorry. Um, my question was, are human beings naturally right. cooperative towards yes. each other? Yes, good, yeah. Well, road rage is actually a very interesting phenomenon. Um, there's something about getting in your car that brings out the monster in people, I mean, I, I'm very much that way myself. So I, I painted a, you know, Saint, you know, Pope Francis, you know, nice drivers, but there's this whole other side, right? And it's, it's like it's, it's like individualism on steroids because you're isolated from other people. You can safely give anyone the finger. You're, um, so you it's like, there's this kind of like sense of entitlement that gets uh, supercharged when you're behind the wheel. Um, but I wanted to go back to like the half, you know, there's been like week long traffic jams in China where people die of starvation. <laughs> That's a real thing. Um, one of the most robust findings of the traffic engineers is that when you increase road capacity, you just get more flow because it's reducing the cost and time you know, to, to commute. And so they finally figured out that adding, road, you know, adding more lanes does not uh, help your congestion problem. This is, uh, so your mention of the, the traffic jam prompted that. Turns out you know, when Uber came into New York City, <clears throat> and of course a lot of the rhetoric surrounding it's weird, the, the issue of ride hailing and autonomous cars and electric cars that get all mixed up in the sort of journalistic hype about these things are the really very distinct issues. Um, Uber is hugely convenient, 
It's also um, been a huge increase in congestion in Manhattan because the, the island is flooded with empty Ubers trolling for cab, I mean, for fares, which is precisely why you can get one so quickly. There's all these black cars trolling around. So um, the mayor, is what, was this in the Bloomberg? No, I think it was under, uh, what's his name, the, the new guy? Yeah, de Blasio. This became like a real issue. In fact, that was why they were trying to uh, kick Uber, Uber out of New York City. It wasn't so much the taxi uh, lobby as it was a congestion issue. Anyway, it's not really related, but. Look, we have a question in the back. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much for your time. Um, this is kind of going away from traffic intersections and more to a general question. Um, do you believe that there are some truly valuable benefits to modern technological advances, or do you see, uh, do you believe that those benefits rarely outweigh the fact that self-government is at stake, and if so, what do those benefits look like? Um, because we need progress, but when do you believe that progress um, is going too far? Thank you. Well, I mean, obviously you have to assess these things individually. I'm a big believer in electronic fuel injection um, as compared to carburetors. Uh, that's technological progress. And it's not, you know, it's not de-skilling anybody or making anybody dumb. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, there's this kind of impulse to categorize people as technophobes or technophiles, and that's, that's obviously pretty dumb. Um, so all I can say is, you know, case by case. Uh, we have a question on the speaker's left. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Crawford. Uh, my name is Spencer. I'm a sophomore here studying chemistry. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that your question was dumb. I hope that's not what that sounded like. I want to clarify that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you talked about how uh, technological advances tend to encourage us to seed control or seed the ability to make judgments. And I wondered if you could talk about, um, from the more, you know, your, your political philosophy side, what do you see as, like, some of the, the negative implications of that of when we begin to, like, seed this control and, you know, cease to, I don't know, cease to, to exercise that judgment? What happens to us as people in that situation, if that makes sense? Well, Thank you. I mean, I think there's an obvious... Um, kind of the, the modern personality getting reformed in the direction of passivity and dependence. Um, and that's visible in a lot of fronts, but I think most prominently in our relation to material reality. I mean, just you're dependent on all these things in your life that you have no idea how they work, how to fix them, never mind like bu building one yourself. So, you know, it's a kind of existential state of mystification where technology really is like magic. And, you know, the whole point of modernity is that we got away from magic, right? It was about reason. So where is the space for, for human reason if you're living in a magical world? It's like a, we're back in the Middle Ages or something. Um, so that's... <laughs> That's something. Yeah. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so, thanks. Um, I was reading a, an article this morning in Psychology Today. Uh, apparently, depression can be attributed to inflam inflammation in the body now. and Like not uh, even in your brain, but elsewhere in your body? Well, yeah, yeah. Wow. Inflammation in the body in general. I, um, I can't, I can't help but think that this problem with AI and the problem with uh, traffic and so forth and, and deaths and safety is uh, sort of reminiscent or, or reflective of um, social science in general and and the objective of sort of controlling and managing ourselves. And I, I, I guess I'm wondering to what extent you think these problems and these difficulties extend into just. Uh, the tension we have in being who we are, uh, which is not entirely rational, quite, quite in fact uh, infused or suffused with emotion. Um, we don't want to die, we don't want to be depressed, we don't want to feel guilty, we don't want to self-criticize, and so we're groping after ways of uh, like relieving ourselves of these tensions. Mm. Um, so it, it seems to me that this, this AI problem 
uh, overlaps significantly with just sort of uh, the existential difficulty of being human that we somehow have never reconciled with. Mm. Yeah, I like that. And, and maybe one kind of gloss on that might be to, I mean, you mentioned social science, um, which often shades into a kind of social engineering. And I think the mentality that guides our, our technocrat uh, masters and uh, you know, whether it's Silicon Valley or sort of the administrative state is to regard everything as um, kind of under the, under the rubric of problem solving, right? Everything, the problems to be solved. And of course there's some aspects of human existence that just don't admit of that kind of understanding. Uh, I don't know if that is at all adjacent to what you were saying, but yeah. We have a question on the speaker's left. Hi, um, so I have a question. So you seem to focus a lot about uh, law on self-government, um, the difference between sort of the chaotic beauty and the rational regulations that we already have, um, not counting the imposition of AI. So I was wondering um, what you thought about the difference between sort of the social aspect of self-government and maybe a personal aspect of like rule following, patience, and you were talking about entitlement and road rage. Yeah, well thank you for that. I, I do think um, the I tried to say that self-command of the individual is an indispensable sort of precondition for self-government as a political form, not least because um, we have to trust that our fellow citizens um, have, you know, aren't going to do things like drive on the wrong side of the yellow line when you're going around a blind curve. Um, or not be so distracted behind the wheel that they run into. So that means having the self-command to keep your attention on the road. So, um, yeah, and I think this is, I mean, this is a long part of the, I, I think I called it the liberal Republican tradition of kind of puts an asterisk on the democratic ideal and says that, um, to be worthy of, of self-rule in the political sense, that people has to be capable of um, this kind of self-command. So this would be, you know, this. In, now you're you're talking about virtue, right? You're um, so a strictly liberal democracy tries to bracket the issue of virtue and say that it's somehow not um, the concern. Uh, it's not a a, a public concern. But, um, you know, <laughs> obviously I'm now touching on a vast uh, literature here, but uh, the idea of um, what, what, what are the sort of cultural um, underpinnings of democratic culture that aren't themselves simply democratic, but depend on some cultural capital of virtue? That would be one way to think about it. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. What do you see as the way that an individual can approach these problems? Because some of these are like larger issues yeah. about like traffic laws and things that we as an individual can't necessarily just like change tomorrow. Yeah. So what are things that individuals can do? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have a good answer to that, but, I, but the, the spirit of the question I think is important because I think people do feel powerless. There's a kind of ideology of inevitableism that is, um, you know, repeated, you know, driverless cars are coming, there's nothing you can do about it, the AI, you know, as though it was simply like physics working itself out. Um, but this is very much, it's a new form of capitalism that we're living under. So I, I can't get it, give up the mic without mentioning a book that has just come out. I have already read it because I got an advanced copy. But it's called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And it's, to my mind, the most uh, successful attempt to understand uh, 
what's really a new form of political economy that is very new in the world, has become very powerful, um, that bears little uh, resemblance to sort of conventional sort of um, profit mode of sort of uh, thinking. I'm not going to try to give us a synopsis of it at 600 pages, but um, I think it's a book it's a book that once you've read it, it gives you a new lens for th to see contemporary economy and everything kind of comes into focus. But one upshot of that is that this kind of feeling of inevitability that we have and powerlessness is very much something that's cultivated as a strategy for a kind of wearing down popular resistance for things that are not responses to market demand. They're kind of top-down projects. Very kind of authoritarian and creepy. I really like the idea of ending on the word creepy here. So, uh, we, we actually, thank uh, you. We have, yeah. We are going to finish actually with one more question. One more you. question, okay. So, oh, Mr. Yeah, well, Dr. Ryan. While I think of it, while I, th while I say the question, you should think of a way to use the word creepy as your last word. Okay. So I'm a fellow motorcyclist with you, and I've ridden many miles between the cars in Los Angeles, and actually think it's pretty safe, but, uh, you know, if you do it right. But um, I've always loved the idea of self-driving cars, and uh, I, you've made me feel like a bad citizen. <laughs> but the reason is, I'm busy. You could do something else. What about that argument? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, you know, when you, uh, so the promotional literature, sometimes you'll see ads, like Volvo had one for a while for their self-driving car project. And it usually shows a guy holding what looks like a small volume of poetry <laughs> as he goes down the highway. And that's, that's conceivable. You you could be doing that, um, or or it may you know it may be that you're surfing the web, and then the rationale part of it is that those uh, 46 minutes of the average American commute in both directions are now available for your attention to be auctioned off to the highest bidder on the internet. That might be part of it as too. And another rationale, business-wise, is that your location and movements through space are one of the most valuable bits of behavioral data about you for predicting your behavior and then in turn manipulating it. So there's that element too. But, um, but yeah, so Pew did a survey of drivers, um, which is interesting. And they asked people, what is, um, the, uh, your ideal commute in terms of length? And the answer was not zero. It was, I think, 20 minutes. So people seem to value this time when they're in their car. Now, you know, if it's self-driving, you would still have that time. So this doesn't really get to your point. But it is interesting that um, people kind of value that time in their car, between work and home, you kind of decompress, you listen to your music. It's the time between work and the second shift, which is home life, right, if you're two working parents. So um, this idea that driving is pure drudgery is one of the main kind of rhetorical points made, you know, when the Silicon Valley people are pushing this. And, you know, there's obviously some truth to that, but it's not the whole truth. Creepy. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.